spent my life living the rules I was brought up morally My family was a strong one My parents trusted me I looked to see the good in men Still do to some extent But man is not infallible And this law lacks common sense in a land where crops abound Tell me honestly How we gonna find all that earth Unless we make the world concrete and Criminals with guns and knives They used to break the peace And the ones who are our peacemakers Are too busy looking for a weed I'm not saying break the law, my friends, but I'm American. We have the right to speak out loud about the things we need to change. Here we are. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for watching the show. It's called The Sustainable Resolution. I am Dr. Milton Bird, and today I have with me David. Let me shake hands with David, my friend. How are you, Dr. Bird? I'm doing okay, my friend. Right. David here, as you can see, has been through some significant challenges in his life. Um, David has a personal history that is, well, to be honest to you, a miracle that he's alive and here. So he has been through a lot, and David's going to tell us a little bit about his personal history. And the reason for doing this is that David is a person who has gone through narcotic use, has severe neuropathic pain, as well as many complicating issues to go along with his physical medical condition. David's here to talk with us about it because he has an absolute desire for best medical practice for his medical conditions. Cannabis is a part of that approach. He is doing so with his physician's awareness, with his family's awareness, and with his situation. He has feelings in regards to cannabis being appropriate for his medical care. Now, having that been said, I'm going to turn some of this discussion over to David. Now, for everybody to understand, David has a bit of a speech impediment. So at times I will repeat what he says. Dave is going to do his very best to communicate clearly. He is an outstanding young man with an intelligent mind because we've spent hours talking. And I'm very proud to have a friend known as David. Well, I'm proud to have you as a friend. Keep in mind you can't hear real good either. I heard that. <laughs> or I was trying to hear that. Anyway, no, I'm 310-2002. I was in a motor vehicle accident when I fell asleep at the wheel, and everything was rough to say the least, but the neuropathic pain coming off of being a paraplegic wasn't that bad. It wasn't until my practice was committed in July of 04 that through a long history I ended up with a hemi fell back to me. Losing my right leg near the half my pelvis, as well as the bottom knee amputation to my only remaining lower extremity. So let me clarify something you just said. You have lost your entire right leg as and you're below your knee on your left leg. Oh, right above the knee. Right above the knee. Yes, okay. sir. And there is challenges still going along with that for wound cares and things uh, like that. It's, it's a never ending cycle. Yes, it, I understand. Um, You've had many things happen to your body since you've began this journey of disability. Oh, yeah. Um, talk about the medications you've been on and how they've affected you. Oh, man. Uh, how much time you got? Uh, 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 probably the main three, you know, the main thing that I've been on throughout the years is opiate medicines or painkillers. As I've been up to a point where I was taking fentanyl transdermal patches, 
Oh gosh, oxycontin, dilated methadone, just. Yeah, you, you, you're taking 10 milligrams of methadone three times a day, TID. You're taking oxycontin, 40 milligrams a day, TID. Uh, Dilated four milligrams three times a day, TID. You, yeah, and that's part of your current medication. Oh no, that's all past prior oh, good. medications. Okay. As I dropped that in the beginning of last year and turned over to use cannabis to so, relieve this immense and persistent neuropathic pain that words can really not touch. Right. I mean, you don't even make a euphemism to what it's like. No, you, you can't understand it until you actually experience it. That's one of those things in life. You feel like cannabis is an effective replacement for those medicines for you, those narcotics? Like I said before, you know, I'd, I'd trade every single pill I got in my drawer for a plant. You would, I'm, I'm going to quote you on that. You would trade them all for a plant, meaning the medicines. Yeah, just metaphorically, just to, to get off and see a man with a piece of paper certifying he was able, left me in this condition. I don't want something made in a laboratory by another man with a piece of paper saying he's able. Whether that's something from God that's wild, that I can rely on emotionally, as well as wonderful pain relief. Well, that's actually called anecdotal evidence, okay. uh, David. Uh, when you look at testimony, and there's a lot of spiritual belief when you talk about Genesis and the plant, and there's a quote in Genesis in regarding to using all plants uh, for the benefit of mankind. Right. Um, this approach of synthetics is another issue, but we'll save that for maybe later in our conversation. No problem. Let's talk about back about how you feel cannabis benefits you. How does it help you? Well, you know, you you start off emotionally, and people come to me all the time and say, you know, Dave, you handled it so well. You've done so well with despite everything. And there's two factors. One, you really don't have a choice. Heard that. And two, you know, I think first and foremost for family, for their support, but cannabis keeps, you know, it's not in the sense of alcohol to where I'm depressed. Um, the use I'm, of alcohol will depress you? Yeah, I find if I'm sad and I drink, it's no, not a good it's not idea. not where you want to go. No, and, you know, my, my legs... And I do say that plurally, as, even though they don't exist and I'm paralyzed to boot. But uh, it feels like they're swelling to explode, like they have a match yeah, you, on my inner thigh. The legs is not there. You feel a ghost pain. Yeah, phantom pain. Yeah. Phantom pain. Yes, sir. And it is persistent. And I'm not saying all the time it's terribly painful. But it is extremely intolerable. Yeah, you have no choice but to put a mask on it and, and well, handle it as best you can. Does the cannabis do anything to distract you from the pain? The cannabis takes pain in the negative numbers. As what it does... It, it lessens it. Yeah, it's whereas there's tension, there's, there's pulling on tendons, there's everything that goes on with my pain. The cannabis just sends waves of euphoria. Through my lower extremities. Okay, so even in that phantom pain, you get a sense of relief from that pain. Yes, a huge sense. A huge sense. Um, let me clarify something to the audience. Along with neuropathic pain, uh, because of David's condition, he has a, what's called muscle spasticity, where the muscles go through microspasms uh, all over his body. It, he, you may see David have shakes every now and then. That's a form of muscle spasticity. As David sits here, if he moves around or if he gets stressed, it becomes visibly obvious. So, do you ever use the cannabis for settling the spasms down or the muscles? Or You better believe it. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, it, it works. You know, I have the baclofen, the antithetical baclofen pump. 
for most spasms. Mm -hmm. You know, they prescribe me this, that, and the other. Nothing works like this. You try, they, they've done uh, pain blocking on you, uh, any Not type of? Not pain blocking, but they've, you know, they've run most, I have a pump here that runs muscle relaxers to my spine. Ah, he has a pump in his side that pumps in muscle relaxers directly into his spine. Yeah. Um, and it is still, you know, in times it just takes the edge off. What would be intense convulsating spasm, mm -hmm. but the cannabis can relax. It not only benefits to the pain level, but it's yeah, it does stop the autonomic muscle spasms. Okay, you've had both your lungs collapsed, haven't you? Yes, sir. And you've had chest tubes and <laughs> and all of that complication with the infections that go along. And if you can name it, I'm colonized with it or had it. Been there, done that, and survived it. Yes, sir. First off, wow! Congratulations on still being here, Thanks, and sir. with the determination you have. This guy's got heart, folks. <laughs> I've seen it, felt it, and heard it. Um, I'm interjecting here a little bit about. He's using medications on a consistent, regular basis to manage the difficulties, such as the muscle relaxants through a pump that goes directly into his spine. But that doesn't quite hold things in balance. As anyone knows with medicine, there's a, a high and a low, or called peak and trough, to the effects. Uh, so maintaining the balance of medication in the body is part of the medication plan, such as using the medicines three times a day we mentioned earlier in his past. Yet those narcotics have an impact on his body and side effects that David's, well, in our conversation earlier, gotten away from. Now, you've yeah. had drug experience in your life. You've, yeah. you've recreationally experienced those things, and you've gone through this learning lesson. Oh, uh, yeah, I want the best system. Say that again. I was not the best citizen. You were not the best citizen. No. I think a lot of people can realize they've been down that journey. No. If we live long enough to learn from our mistakes, hopefully we grow from those mistakes. No. You feel like you've grown a lot? It, it's a tough question to ask. It, yeah, it's, uh, there's backsliding ah. and there's going forward, but, you know, that's human. Yeah, it is. But, yeah, I mean, in a sense, as a man, you know, I, I think my morals, my values, I've, you know, I've seen death four times. And it's kind of interesting to see it and be right on the edge of it and climb back. And, yeah, you change after that. Yes, you do. Um, in my medical practice, doing critical care medicine, I've watched a lot of people go through the conditions you've talked about, and, and I've been involved in that care, yeah. one thing that has always amazed me is how much strength that develops in a person such as yourself when you literally survive and endure when you, ha that's, you have no choice. Yeah, that's the primary. You have no choice. You have no choice. Uh, that's something that I would like to communicate to everybody. When someone has a chronic and severe issue of neuropathic pain, not to mention the muscle spasticity and all the other complications that David has, when you have no choice but to put a mask on it, you do it. You do it, and you do it, and you do it, moment by moment, day by day, sometimes with every breath. You're trying to put a face on it just because you have to. Yeah, I wrote a line one time. Let, let smile I hide behind it, pour it up, put up all the sea. The smile is on the cover, the deadness that's underneath. The deadness, the deadness, the sense of loss. That was, no, that was the time before I used cannabis. Ah. That was a on, darker period. Ah, when you were back on those strong on, medications. On, on the wavering up and down mood swings of the Side effects? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, uh, yeah, Dr. Sunil Agarwal's research now demonstrates that uh, cannabis is 10 times more effective than opioids for pain management, especially neuropathic pain management. I must stress this. I don't find cannabis as an acute pain reliever mm -hmm. as more of a chronic pain reliever. 
Okay, does it, how, what does it, cannabis actually do for you? Well, uh, it takes tension in my legs I could go into for days. You will talk about the different feelings that I get. And in replacement, it's just this constant like electro waves yes. of euphoria that go all the way from my toes and my feet feel as if they're pumping full of blood. And it's just a really good feeling. Like I've never had blood before. It's it's kind of it's like a, a sensory thing. You, you, yeah. you, ha you have a different feeling using the cannabis, and yeah. it, it, is it a sense of a well-being? It's a sense of I can, you know, not show it in my mood and, and be okay. Okay, maybe well-being is not the description. You feel better. That's the best way I can kind of keep it simple. Yeah, I feel more peace. Okay, um, you told me earlier in our conversation that it stimulates you. And in some senses, yes, I do believe it does, because you know, I find that in morning time, kind of like my coffee in some sense. Okay, kind of like a cup of coffee. Um, one of the things that cannabis researching right now needs to be researched further, going from a Schedule One to Schedule Three, if the federal government will do it, is to allow such investigations, like what, what Dave is talking about here. Some people, it's a stimulant. Yeah. Some people, it, it's not. There are such a complexity in the cannabinoids in, in the plant, uh, the synergy of the plant together, that right now science cannot duplicate it no matter what we do synthetically. More research is needed. Excuse me for interjecting that, David. But no. You want to talk some about, well, you know, I was going to talk about uh, the criminality, but before that, let's talk a little bit about the politics of it, because I know you have an yeah. interest in that. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard that we have a bipartisan support now. Yes, yeah, is a bipartisan group in Raleigh that has sponsored House Bill 577. Um, I'm hoping to know more about an update for myself this coming week to see how it's going on for the lobbying in that regards. But right. yes, there is a bipartisan support, both Republican and Democrat. Although I want to make note that the Democratic Party last year passed a unanimous resolution, this is the North Carolina Democratic Party, uh, uh, passed a resolution and absolute support, a unanimous support for medical cannabis. All right. Um, what do you think would happen if the state actually allowed medical cannabis to become legal in North Carolina? Just your opinion. In my opinion, you know, A, People, certain people, not everybody. Certain people like myself, like yourself, who would benefit neuropathically and other conditions from it, yes. I think it would put a boost in our economy. A boost in the economy. You think it would be a big economic stimulus? I, I have, I mean, common sense tells me yes. I mean, I don't. One would hope. I'm not the math major. My father is sit down and crunch the figures, but yeah, I mean, I would, common sense says it's a billion dollar industry. It's a billion dollar industry, yes, and we've seen that in the legal states. It's it's keeping the economy afloat in those legal states. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you have things now, like people we need the most are teachers getting laid off. Ah. And, you know, we have something that could boost our, our state's economy but now we'll left teachers, I mean, what, what are we getting at? Well, I mean, teachers are just one example of many ways the economy is fracturing. Oh, um, yeah. The employment, well, we, we could talk for days on how that's going. No. So you think that medical cannabis being managed by healthcare professionals is the best approach for it, on this subject? I think it's the best approach with exception of uh, the right paperwork being filed for each condition. As I have to stress, it's not. All right, the prognosis is your arm being a cast two months, and then after five, you're pain-free. Maybe you're not. Maybe you tore some tendons. But there's a very good chance that, you know, all right, we can take the opiates for a little while, 
But I think the right paperwork and regulations need to be put in place. So as an example, if somebody's condition is in short term, you're doing pain management through the opioids thinking they're going to heal, but there develops a condition out of it, such like we talked about yeah. with neuropathic pain, then there's an appropriate point where the medicine's changed over. See, there's more research like that. that that's actually a good point of view, yeah. but we lack the ability to scientifically pursue that in the medical field because of federal regulations. In the state, if we legalize it, we might have that opportunity within the state. Right. Yeah, good time to take a drink of water. Yeah, I hear you. Now folks, you, you see, oh, I was just gonna comment on that picture, Lisa. Um, mm. You know, these pictures are plants, I, I think, from out in California. Cannabis comes in all kinds of sizes because there's many different variations to the plant to the area of the world it's growing in. Um, there are three types of cannabis. I've said before, there's rudialis, there's sativa, and there's indica. And, of course, rudialis is what's known for construction hemp or non-medical hemp. Then the cannabis sativa and the cannabis indica have different characteristics for medical application, which again, further research on a federal level. Um, David, you've had what I call the criminal experience. Yes, sir, I did. Uh, criminal to a sense, um, seeing out the first time, you know, knock on wood, that's that I've ever gotten caught, but I did get you know, misdemeanor possession of marijuana. And a a misdemeanor possession, possession of marijuana. Possession of marijuana, under an ounce, yeah. And a thousand dollars later, I am charged with not convicted, but I, I'm on disability. I make six issues still a month. A thousand dollars is a stretch. That's Almost two months of income. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, the cop, even though I know she, she had to do her job, she felt kind of bad in that sense. She saw a man like me, and but she did it anyway. Well, and, I mean, again, that's her job. Yeah. Um, the law is structured the way it is. Uh, and your observation was that she had compassion for you, but she still followed through with the law. Yeah, and I understood, and she went back for me in court, so. Well, I thank the honor and integrity she showed. Oh, um, yeah. One of, the, one of the things about the criminality that I, I really push is that the system has created this criminality process. And it's time to stop the criminality and create the functionality. Um, that's where the medical community can come into play. Functionality for such a issue of a, something of a, as a plant that's been created as a criminalizing process, well, from the sense of being human, that's wrong. And now we have the scientific data showing that that criminality is not the case. As last week when I w was doing the review of the first part of the movie called Reefer Madness, showing where it back in 1936, it was labeled as a violent hallucinogenic mm. narcotic, um, which nowadays no. we're, with common sense knows that's not true. Uh, and yet mm. the scientific evidence is backing it. So David, for yourself, as long as your life is yours, you feel cannabis is, is a good choice of best practice for medicine for you? It's, you know, I, I, I've weighed in and out because of pressure on me to stop by ones who love me and want me to, you know, because they're not fully on the level of what goes on here and how cannabis helps. But, you know, do I, do I think it's a good mess for me? Yeah, and it will be practice by me as long as I have a quality of life to call quality of life. Well, this is one thing though I want to really get clear. You feel it is best medical practice as part of your medication 
approach. Well, yeah, because well, Wade Ellis, I cannot just not go without anything. Right. And the opiates, uh-uh. That is a trap to addiction, as my father. It's been high school principal for 29 and a half years. He told me that a few months he was on after a knee replacement. He was looking at his clock, saying, I'm starting to take another one. And it's not the myth that, oh, well, if you don't abuse them, you'll never get addicted to them. Uh, well, that is a myth. Now, I've heard that so many times, so many people. And it's like, I'm sorry, you really can't help this. But it pulls you in and traps you. The, the process of narcotics is kind of like, um, well, I, I'll give you an example in parallel, and this is a pretty far stretch, but it's the same kind of patterning. When a law enforcement officer or, or anybody in the judicial system has a suspicious mind, which they have to to do their job, Right. That negative thinking sooner or later leads to dysfunctional patterns in human behavior. Hmm. Um, it's the same kind of addictive process with narcotics. You use them, they lead to a dysfunctional pattern. Yeah. Because the effect, be it a suspicious mind or in this case a narcotic, leads to these certain patterns or being a product of those patterns okay. or side effects. Uh, you know, I, and my son's in law enforcement, criminal justice major, and one of the things we talk about is how do you combat those suspicious mind issues and maintain a functional, healthy relationship with yourself? Because a lot of people going down those paths don't. You see patterns of those kind of sociological issues in the medical field with people being rescuers um, right. and dealing with these medicines and all these hurts and these people and the compassion that goes along. This is called the human event. Okay. Okay. We've got to look at how we best balance the human event. And you're trying to look at how to keep your life in balance while you have it. You know, why well, it's quite a life left. If there's anything on this earth I didn't need you doing, it's me to quit smoking cigarettes. Ah, we talked about some of that earlier. Now. Yeah, that is, which, like I said, with the surgery coming up, there is no if ands, or buts, no pun intended. But I got to throw it away. Well, let's talk about cigarette smoking for a minute. <clears throat> Yeah, I've heard you can use cannabis for cessation of that. Actually, there is research exploring, uh, and that's more, again, more research needed, but in some of the recovery approaches, um, I authored a program, a hospital-based recovery program for smoking to recovery, it was called. And um, in looking at that smoking relationship, uh, there's a pattern of intimacy. Right. Okay. It's there for you when you want it to. It does what you want it to, and it doesn't talk back. There you go. That actually is more intimate and close than a spouse can be. So people that's who that's more close than a dog can be. <laughs> Heard that? Because um, a dog can do what you don't want it to. Uh, but go ahead. But the but uh. the nicotine, the cigarette, is a coping tool. Right. And you've used it as. Well, a, it's a tool. A crutch. A so. crutch. Um, yeah. But you know you've got another surgery coming up, and you know you've got to quit smoking yeah. for that surgery. So your challenge is to be your own best friend, and you're learning a lot about how your medicine history has taught you to understand your medicine use right, right now. And you now know that this smoking relationship well, it's a risk versus benefit. Is that nicotine cigarette a benefit to you or a risk at this point? It's always a huge risk. It's a huge risk. Yeah. You've got to tell yourself that. You just told yourself that. What, putting it down and changing that relationship from risk to benefit. See, one of the things that got you into cannabis use is that you saw the risk you were going with with the narcotics, right. and you recognized 
through the experience and experimentation, let's be honest, yeah, yeah. but you discovered that it had a benefit. Right. And you've been describing that benefit to me a bit in our conversation. Oh, yeah. Looking at these two patterns of smoking, looking at these two patterns of smoking, cannabis smoking and nicotine smoking are two completely different chemical and biological relationships. No smoking is harmless, yet in cannabis, smoking is an administration route that represents a benefit outweighing short-term risk. Ah, but long-term use hmm. can be a problem and more research no, no. has got to be done. You feel like, I'm gonna take a quick look here, making sure, you know, we've covered a lot of our stuff already. This, uh, um, they slow up a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering here, and this has been really good. I want to thank you, David. Hey, man, it's, it's my pleasure, Mel. Well, let me ask you this. We can do call-ins and, and for viewers and, and calling in. Would, yeah. you, would you like to have some call-ins? That'd be fine, Bobby. I'll talk to anybody. Well, Lisa, can't, is, is it, can we not do it? Or, take your time. Folks, if any of you are watching the show and you would like to do a call-in, give us about five to ten minutes to get some of the technology set up. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing call-ins because, well, mm. David and I are friends. We were going to talk. <laughs> uh, yet in our talk, we've already covered 90% of what we were going to talk about. You know, one thing is, is that the... Well, I don't understand, Sal, but, you know, some people say, well, as soon as they legalize it medically, that everybody will have it. It'll be legal, you know, to go on 7-Eleven and get it. You know, I'm as against that as I can possibly be. You know, I don't, I don't want everyone to see, because we are a powerhouse nation amongst nations. Now, there's no doubt of it. It's the common sense says, if you buy a carton of Marlboro joints, we would not be that nation. And I just think medicinally, there's a huge place. To every person over, say, AD, no place. I don't think. Well, uh, of course, not you, to everybody. The, the argument that can be heard about that is that adults have the choice of alcohol, have the choice of well, yeah, tobacco. Yeah. Um, well, at least it is a better option. <laughs> well, you know, I honestly believe that society has to go through the experience of it to mature enough how to sociologically society can handle these, what I'll call, issues of experiencing in life. Because people right. do experience. I mean, you think back to your earlier years. You oh. went out and experienced too much. You've been there, done I that, and survived it. I don't even want to talk about it, but yeah. yeah. yeah you've survived it. You've learned from it. Learn not at, to go back. Yeah, and you've learned not to go back. Exactly. See, now there is the maturity. You didn't have it years before. You got it now. You've paid the hard price getting there. Actually, you say I paid the hard price, so I paid one of the best options. Yeah. Tell Pre me more. Well, well, Ted, there's always... Could kill somebody that day. I fell asleep at the wheel. No, I wasn't intoxicated. It's a very long, drawn out, but, you know, prison, lots of things could have been a whole lot worse. And then, yeah, sure, I can't walk, and yeah, this really wasn't asked for. But I got life still. You've still got, yes, you've survived it. Yeah. That's why I call been there, done that, and survived it. Um, so, Lisa, you've got the number up for call-ins, and anybody out there that wants to call in, if you have personal experience in, in dealing with your issues and medically related use of cannabis, uh, please give us a call and let us talk together because this is about common sense, maturity, and exposure to the opportunities of change so that we can develop best practice to allow research to go forward and to explore the endocannabinoid system through proper medical research. Um, 
David, if you could back up in your health situation and you were at the stage of going from the opioids and other medications of dependency to substituting it with cannabis, would you have wanted to be in a research program yeah. to look at it? Okay. Yeah, because you know, no one I know now and the coming off of the opiates. You know, the 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 stopping of the medicines and how hard that was. Ah, coming no, off. No no one I know now after five years of dependency like I was. You know, yeah, I had cannabis to benefit, you know, and to bring that crutch. Or not the crutch, but to, to relieve the immense but pain and uncomfort. Right. But, you know, just the withdrawal symptoms, it was not worth it. You mean for the opioids there? Right. The, 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 the hard narcotics you were using. The opioids, the, the withdrawal I mean, methadones, was, mighty potent, oxycontin is as well, as well as Dilaudid. Um, yeah, methadone says active in your bloodstream, you know, it's a silent kill. You know, it kills you and you don't even realize and you're abusing it, and you never set out to do that, but... It happens. It happened. Yeah. It happens. You, um... Well, one thing I want to touch base on is that, you know, you look at a man like me, and you say, you don't see many of me. There's not around. much of you here anymore. No, there's not. That's... That old Stone Temple Pilot song, I'm half the man I used to be. You know, but bottom line, you know, there's half a million people somewhat that have acquired spinal cord injuries. Now, you got around 68% in paras like myself being paralyzed from here down. You're at a T3 break on T3 down. T3 break, yeah. To an even higher percentage and quadriplegia of having, you know, neuropathic problems in their lower extremities or below their injury level. But then when you go ahead and you tack on double amputee, you just ten forward on each leg. But, you know, I, you may not see many people like me, but we're everywhere. From yeah. cancer to AIDS to Parkinson's to even glaucoma, we're everywhere, and we hurt. I hear that. Um, as, as David was saying, you know, th there's roughly a half a million people in this country right now dealing with similar kind of disability and challenges. Um, I'll relate this for my own self, for the camera. I had a C6-7 break. Um, and I have lots of medical experience looking at these conditions. I know I was just one or two steps away from going down the path of what Dave has gone. And I'm thankful I have not gone down that path. At the same time, wow, you don't want to be there, because yet you have no choice. When you have those kind of injuries, you have no choice because in sense it's a do or die. That, right? I mean, it's all definition of word quality of life. If your life is miserable because of just persistent pain and uncomfortable swelling and burning and tugging on your tendons and your legs, what quality of life is there? You know, and that's the whole meaning of the word. You know, I want my quality to be the best it can be. You know, I don't want my liver to look like a hockey puck. So I took hockey cotton or had a lot of put in my pump. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. But you know, if you can maintain it as well as I have on cannabis, then I, I beg the ones out there in charge to please take this message and push it forward. As that's the best thing I can give you. Thank you, David. We have a caller. Go ahead, caller, and thank you. Hey, how you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. I hope I'm you good, are. Sir. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's sad that uh, a lot of people can't come and talk about that because they're not no longer around. Because it's 
Yeah. I see what you're saying. I mean, some some people, it many times I've said got lucky and got a way out. But then again, it's, it's a blessing to be here, and we're all put here for a reason. Don't ever doubt that, caller. Have you had, uh, caller, have you had somebody close to you uh, go down this journey? This yeah, I had a friend that had a, a brain tumor that it ended his life and stuff. And there at the end, that cannabis seemed to be the only thing that really eased his mind. They mm -hmm. actually gave him some medical pills. Marinol. That, that were, uh, yeah. Synthetic, like, yeah. 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 And, and basically what that is is synthetic THC. And that's legal <laughs> right now. Uh, the psychoactive. It's uh, seven hundred eighty dollars a prescription, but sure, it's legal. He's been there. No. Oh, oh, I understand that. I understand that because uh, you you gotta pick. The government doesn't pay for that stuff. Nope. How much do you say it cost it for the? To get each one filled for my primary and secondary insurance is seven hundred eighty a month. To them, thank God, not oh, me. Yes. Okay. So now, if I was paying out of pocket, I would just say, hey, I can buy enough cannabis and not bother y'all for half a year. Okay, now let me mm. re restate that. I'm not sure it got across. No, I probably didn't. The insurance companies who cover the synthetic THC, um, $780 for a prescription. Um, Yet for that same amount of money, of course, you can't, you can buy uh, a, lot. a lot of cannabis mm -hmm. for that amount of money compared to that one prescription purchase. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be bothering them next month, put it that way. Well, one of, one of the challenges here, actually, you bring up a point when it comes, it, Caller, are you still on the air? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, I'm listening. Anytime you want to speak up, go right ahead. But one of the things that... What? That I wanted well, your to, point. Yeah, my your po point <laughs> was good about the price and stuff. Well, here's what I find interesting: the profits that go along with the pharmaceutical industry when you have cannabis that is effective. Now, I'm going to use these words appropriately: are effective for replacement of certain medication regimens which represent a reduction of expense for the patient is not always to the economic interest of the pharmaceutical companies. Mm. They want to make money, and if you look at those profit returns these pharmaceutical companies make, they're significant. And yes, research and development is expensive, yet at the same I, time, it's a patient's I expense. I was just watching the news earlier, and they said that this country alone in the whole world is responsible for 80, 90 percent of the Vicodin that's passed out because they pass it out like candy. And, uh, you know, that's a big problem and they're, they're studying that now. Yeah, so right. your, your deal is fixing to come into a real Big plus, because they're studying that addictive Vicodin and stuff. Well, you take drugs like opioids, sir, and you you look at the figures that they just did a poll on, and you look at how many tens of thousands of people each year overdose on painkillers versus drugs of the extremeness of cocaine, methamphetamines, heroin. Uh -huh. You know, they can't even kill you. Like the bank well, there's yeah. a lot more people dying from medication abuse than there is yeah. from the drug war related they just abuse. Reported, they just reported on TV that people in 13, 14 states out west were getting killed more by drug overdoses than mm -hmm. car wrecks. Yeah, I, that's. Probably very factual if you saw it. Well, see, right there is an issue as a phys physician um, I have concern about. When are we going to have the opportunity to reframe our 
drug recovery and rehabilitation where we develop a common sense approach to medication use instead of just the issue of abuse. All right, We have fundamentals in that research, yet it needs to mature considerably more to represent a balance of common sense for the patient doing that drug use, that medication use. You've gone well, through... Go ahead. Well, that, when it's not a business no more, and it wow. actually turns into a health care, then you might see some difference. But right now, it's a big business for a lot of people, the drug companies, the hospitals, the doctors, <clears throat> and everything. When there is no more business left in it, then it will be health care again. Uh, that's a whole other subject, and yes, I agree with that. Um, I would love to have one of our shows in the future do have some discussion on the sustainability of the health care system, yet we're not at that point in no. our program development. Uh, so, caller, I want you to call back again when we get to that so we can work this discussion more. All right, thank you for calling, buddy. Hey, thank you all. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, you too. He brings up an interesting point about um, the economics of the medical field. We, of course, we've heard about pharmaceutical companies and what kind of profit margins they make. And, but the manufacturers of medical equipment, I mean, that's expensive stuff. Oh, buddy, buddy. You want to see the dollar figure skyrocket? Right there. But he brought up the point about how Americans using Vicodin are, what did he say, 80 to 90 percent of the world's population in use and drug abuse with Vicodin? Um, that's from, from the caller in because I don't know that statistic specifically, but the point is America has more drug use related prescription problems than any other country in the world. There's something to look at and be understood there and healthcare professionals are trying to frame that up now and that's no disrespect to where we are. It's been a long learning curve. We have another caller. Go ahead, caller. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Four twenty. A day in which people gather around and celebrate marijuana culture. Mm. They do so by talking about, thinking about, masturbating. Okay, to uh, we got problems with the call. Marijuana. Yeah, we got problems with with that caller signal coming through. So. Unfortunately, we, we've we've lost our signal. Whatever that background yeah. was, um, somebody took us TV. I'm uh, not sure what the problem was there. I, I don't know, but it's, it's like, gone. Yeah, uh, I don't know what your views are. Maybe we should discuss this. But you know, my views on doctors that are that should hold the ability and should not to prescribe such things as medical cannabis. In your mind, what doctors do you think should be all doctors or should it be certain ones with certain regulations they must follow by? Well, because of the, the way our current medical system is set up, I would say all physicians have that authority now. No. However, the law blocks certain authority, and that is one of the things that are in challenge because the patient physician relationship is considered sacred and the professional aspects of being a physician. Mm -hmm. Right now physicians are trained on a basic focus of how to apply this. Okay. okay, so across the board to answer your question. Yet we've also seen in in the healthcare that people do specialize and there will be those who will specialize in this industry yeah. for appropriate healthcare practice. There's a lot of reform that's needed in healthcare and including cannabis therapy being part of it. Yet we have not gotten to that level yet in healthcare reform, especially when you look at the cluster in the federal government when it comes to health care reform. It's a question of sorts, yeah. I've had, I've had some experience going to Washington, D.C. and talking about health care reform in committees and, uh, in the past, and, and I, I walk out of there just shaking my head, and my heart is heavy listening to what I've listened to. Mm. Uh, people 
need to have their patient rights mm -hmm. and human rights build, be the foundation of health care reform. And unfortunately, uh -huh. I don't see it as that. It's the business, it is the economic, it is the governmental model of that stuff that keeps driving it. And unfortunately, patients seem to come last. Well, uh, I, maybe because I am a seasoned veteran at this, but you know, I just dismiss them because I know I can get another doctor. So they come in, I don't like how they treat me as a patient. When I know my body better than they ever will, Bye. And that's the thing you need to really emphasize people in the, health, the medical system that are in hospitals. You don't like how you're being treated to get somebody new. Yep, patients have that right. Um, oh, yeah. You're, you're actually bringing up the patient bill of rights in that discussion. And got real bored and read it one day. You got real, you read it one day. <laughs> well, like, it's personal, isn't it? It strikes home a lot of ways for you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm. Been there enough, so. And survived it. Um, patient rights. You feel cannabis is part of patient rights. You yeah. You feel it is a constitutional right? Yeah, I do. You know, if we're going to put something like alcohol as a legal and marketable substance, then, yeah, uh, cannabis is constitutional rights at least. If not, we got double standards. Uh, double standards. We have a caller now, and we'll come back to the double standard right. here in a minute. Go ahead, caller. All right. Hey, Dave. This is Dr. Bird. I hope y'all all out this evening. I just wanted to share my history with uh, smoking marijuana. Okay, uh, buddy. I went into service when I was a young man. Went in at 16 and a half. I had my experience with alcohol. I didn't start smoking dope until I was about 18 years old. Okay. Uh, they called it the gateway drug. Now, I have to say, I experimented with a few other things, LSD and cocaine. I found that those weren't the trick for me. I found that smoking marijuana was. I got out of the service about 18 and a half, lived for a year on the beach, enjoyed myself, uh, basically mm -hmm. quit drinking, used marijuana for recreational purposes. At 23, I had a severe motorcycle accident, got hit head on. Now, uh, I know they have me on different medicines while I was in the hospital and stuff. I don't remember much of that. Right, but it uh, came to a point where I refused to take any kind of pills. I wanted to smoke my dope because it gave me a peace of mind. Uh, I could sit back, mm -hmm. relax, wasn't anxious about things. Uh, for a while, my whole right side was paralyzed. I, uh, thank goodness, got my leg back first where I could walk. And then uh, through concentration, I got my right arm working again. Not at 100%, but uh, I contribute that to mental concentration through the use of marijuana where I focused on wanting my arm to work again, and the next thing you know, it moved. I no, was so thrilled. Now, I have to say, I uh, get depressed sometimes because life isn't what it is for me, and I feel bad for you, David. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not quite as severe shape as you, but uh, there's times I get depressed. And that's the first thing I reach for. I don't want any kind of pills. I refuse any kind of medication like that. You feel... And, uh, you know, it not only cures physical pain, as far as I'm concerned, it can cure mental pain, depression, anxiety. You know, it's, it's very good for lots of things. You know, like don't, say, don't, don't say, you know, you don't have problems as bad as mine, because... Any problem, big, small, you know, it could be something as bad as D3 paralysis and sounding like you're two half pints deep all the time, like I do now, or it could be... Or like his description. It could be a teenage girl for a senior prom having to fit because her hair ain't good. You know, you never know. Well, uh, that 
the thing I wanted to ask you is, it, it, caller, you feel cannabis has been an effective role for your personal health care, effective Correct. medication, okay? Uh, uh, I also forgot to include that I had severe closed head injury from this motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. I got hit head on, uh, so, you know, I was... I was found about 25 yards from where the car impacted me, and uh, I didn't have my helmet on properly, so when I hit the ground, the helmet just took a severe flight from me another 100 yards. Uh, the helmet didn't do anything for my arm, which got broken in the accident. It didn't do anything for the nerve damage. I, I know helmets have a beneficial purpose for riding, you know, but... Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't take care of the problems that I had. Well, and let me tell you something that's, that, that has been demonstrated in research, and uh, the Veterans Administration has recognized this in the legal states so that mm -hmm. cannabis use is appropriate for brain injuries because uh, the United States uh, has a patent on cannabis, cannabinoids, for, uh, as a neuroprotectant. And one of the things that they are, are looking at uh, where they can do the research is that cannabis as a neuroprotectant has minimized and even prevented brain injury from the issues of, the, of brain trauma. Um, no, but what, what the caller needs to do more than anything is call it if you're passionate about cannabis in your health care and in your well-being, correct? Yeah. Well, then you need to call your local representative for your county and do just as I did by finding Dr. Bird here, call that rep and get things pushed along as quick as possible. Well, thank you, David. You can also, you know, contact any state representative or senator, any of their office as a citizen of North Carolina, and you can also go to your local government and make a request for a resolution of support for House Bill 577. 577. Uh, 577. Five, seven. Yes, uh, we yes, have sir. only about two minutes left, two, three minutes, two, three minutes, two minutes left for our show. Uh, your call has been wonderful. Thank you, caller. I sure appreciate you calling in, and please call again on the show. No, I want okay. to. Y'all have a good evening. You too. You too. Yes, um, thank you, sir. David, it's been a blessing having you here, my man. Hey, man, I hope you do it many more times. I, I hope we have the opportunity again because there's other things we want to talk about uh, because this is a major social issue and you are a wealth of experience because mm. of your journey. Because I've been man there and I made it. Yeah, you're still surviving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank it has you been all. wonderful. We're getting ready to go off the air here in a moment. We still got to keep going, though, one more minute. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an honor and a privilege to sit here with David Freeman, and I look forward to the next time we get to speak. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good night. When we're allowed to use for pain, morphine and heroin, expensive drugs that we did it, my man. I honestly don't understand. Oh, how can we be so arrogant that we would change God's law? It says all plants and flower and herbs are here to help us all. And hemp alone can fill our needs. Petroleum. But DuPont and the pharmacies don't want that to happen. All DuPont and the pharmacies don't want that to happen. I'm not saying break the law, my friends, but I'm Things we need to 